Okay, members, can we uh, call the meeting to order then? And can I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee on Re- COVID-19 Response? Uh, agenda item number one in the minute, is the minutes of the proceedings of the previous meeting, which was held on the 18th of March. Members are asked to note these minutes, uh, which are at page three of your packs, and which, have, uh, which I have agreed earlier. Members should also note that the minutes of evidence from that meeting have been published in the official report available on the committee's web page. Agenda item two is a statement from the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. I received notification yesterday that the First and Deputy First Minister wish to make a statement uh, at a meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee today. A copy of the statement that they intend to make is included in your packet, page six. I would like to welcome the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to this meeting of the committee. I now invite ministers to make their statement, which should be heard by members without interruption. Following the statement, then there will be an opportunity for members to ask their questions. So, uh, I call the first minister or the deputy first minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And we're, of course, mindful that we remain in national mourning, and we wish to make a short public statement. The executive met today to discuss the COVID-19 situation, and we received some important. De- we reached some important decisions, and we feel it is right to share the details first with MLA colleagues via the ad hoc committee. Colleagues will know that today marks the first formal review under our pathway out of restrictions. We have reviewed the current situation, uh, we have measured the risks, and we have looked at the health, economic, and societal data. We have been mindful of steps taken elsewhere, and our decisions have been taken on what is best for us here at this time. We have taken a series of decisions in the interests of families, young people and children, in the interests of well-being and in the interests of our economy. We are bringing forward a balanced package of relaxations which will restore many of the familiar aspects of everyday life that have been missed dearly over recent times. There will be more to do and more decision points to come, but this is a landmark day as we step forwards firmly and with confidence on our pathway to recovery. All generations across society have coped with the most difficult of times, and we are proud of the way that the people of Northern Ireland have pulled together to save lives. The everyday positive choices made by so many have reduced the transmission of this deadly virus to the point today where we are able to roll back a significant number of restrictions. We are doing so in a careful and considered way, taking account of the prevailing health situation and the robust mitigation measures that can be relied upon to help keep people safe. We must also stress that while we are taking important decisions today, the virus is still with us, it is still dangerous and we cannot drop our guard. People are still infected, hospitals are still receiving patients, and unfortunately, people are still at risk of serious illness and death. So we ask everyone to be mindful, to step out, but to step carefully. And please continue with the public health basics. Wash your hands, wear your face covering, maintain distance, and get fresh air around you. The Executive discussed the need to reflect on the strategic context for our decisions. We are incredibly proud of our vaccines programme. We are thankful to everyone who has responded to the invitations to take the vaccine, and we thank you for doing this in the wider interests of your family and community. Please remember that the vaccine does not give you superpowers, but it is a vital weapon in our fight against the virus. We continue to ask everyone to take up the jab when your turn comes. The logistical operations for the delivery of the vaccines are truly humbling, and we again want to thank everyone who is involved from planning through to delivery. It is a truly impressive operation to which we owe a great deal. We are also mindful that schools have returned fully this week. We recognise the incredible efforts of everyone in the education sector, parents and our young people. This is where we need to be, children and young people engaged in their education, socialising in positive and constructive ways seeing their friends in safe environments, investing in their futures, working towards their life aspirations. That is the future we all want for our young people. We have looked at the different risks in different settings, whether that be inside or outdoors. We have agreed some next steps, which we trust will take us forward in a hopeful and positive direction. We have received advice from our Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor. We remain grateful to them, as ever, for their professional advice. Our decisions today are aimed at lifting restrictions where we can. We cannot do everything people would want, and we are sorry about that, and we know it will be disappointing for some. 
We will pay constant attention to the steps needed to keep us moving forward, and that is an absolute commitment across the parties in the Executive. So the Executive has agreed that alongside the decisions we have made today, we will also set out a series of steps which we will wish to take next if the conditions permit. We do so in the clear understanding that we remain driven by data and not dates, in the knowledge that we have a clear commitment to this place and our citizens that we will keep these steps under review, and in the knowledge that we will ratify these indicative dates only if the prevailing circumstances permit. Mr Speaker, we have decided the following can resume from the 23rd of April. Driving instruction and theory tests, driving tests, closed contact services including training, outdoor visitor attractions including outdoor activity centres, equine assisted therapy and learning on an indoor and outdoor basis in gatherings of up to 30 people, Outdoor sport organised by a club, individual or individuals affiliated will be extended to include squad training, and competitive outdoor sport organised by a club, individual or individuals affiliated with participation numbers not exceeding 100 and no spectators permitted. We have also agreed that static band practice or rehearsal will be permitted in agreed outdoor locations from the 23rd of April. From the 30th of April, we have agreed to increase the numbers permitted to gather in domestic settings outdoors to 15 people from no more than three households, reopen all of retail, reopen and permit overnight stays in self-contained tourist accommodation for one household only, reopen unlicensed premises outdoors only with a maximum of six people from two households per table and contact details recorded. Reopened license premises, including social clubs, outdoors only, limited to six people from no more than two households and contact details recorded. Remove the curfew on takeaways, remove the curfew on off licences, and permit individual activities in gyms, swimming pools, and other large venues, including with a carer, and to allow one to one training, coaching, with social distancing. Mr Speaker, thank you for facilitating this statement today. And again, thank you for the opportunity to update members as we take our next steps on the journey towards recovery. This really is a good day, and it's a day of optimism. It's a day where we all can look forward um, in the hope of a brighter future for all. There is no doubt in any of our minds that these have been the toughest of times for people and for families for businesses, for workers and for communities. The restrictions have been a necessary way to suppress the virus, to save lives and protect our health service, but they certainly have taken their toll, and it's incumbent upon us all to move forward as soon as circumstances allow. But we must do so with caution and have maximum mitigations in place to avoid the virus reclaiming its grip on our society. So today is a very important milestone that we're moving in the right direction. As a package of measures, we believe that the easements that we have agreed today will make a fundamental difference to people's lives and their well-being. We have been under the latest form of lockdown for 110 days. We know how our people need hope and that our people need us to take some steps out of restrictions. We as an executive recognise the pressures and the restrictions and that, what that has done to our people. Not being able to see family and friends, not being able to go out and about and do the things that matter to us. So it is important to note the cautious first steps that we have already taken as an executive. Colleagues will know that even before today, we have reopened primary and post-primary schools, increased the number who can meet outdoors in the garden from six to ten from two households, removed the stay-at-home provision in the legislation, moving to a stay local and work from home message, allowed contactless click and collect to resume for non-essential retail, resumed outdoor sports training for up to 15 people, permitted marriage and civil partnership customers um, to have viewed the facilities of venues. We have reopened outdoor retail, including garden centres and car washes, and we have increased the numbers of people permitted to attend marriages, civil partnerships and funerals now informed by a risk assessment of the venue. And we now can build on all of that and walk us into further lifting of restrictions for the benefit of all in a safe and sustainable way. We need to remain mindful of the COVID situation and we continue to be advised on all the relevant factors. We are not out of the woods. We do face risks from variants of concern. We face risks from social gatherings. We need to, be, to always remain mindful of the public health guidance. Wash your hands, wear face coverings, limit our social contacts, 
Fresh air and ventilation are part of our protection, and we understand the desire to get out and about. And we ask everyone to consider how they will make use of the decisions that we have taken today as an executive. So take care of yourselves and each other. We have reached our decisions today very carefully, and we know that everyone out there is looking for certainty on those next steps. We can't at this stage guarantee every step towards the end of this, but we do want to give that hope. We want to set out where we wish to go next, and on that basis, this has to be kept under review, and we know that people will understand that. COVID, unfortunately, has no respect for timetables or dates. It's no respect for plans or for undertakings. So I will set out our aspirations for lifting restrictions in the coming weeks and months on a basis that I know will be understood. The following is an indicative date, but it's a date by which we hope to be able to make moves, but a date which will be kept under review. So in that context, from the 24th of May, we hope to reopen unlicensed, unlicensed and licensed premises indoors with mitigation, remain, up, reopen the remainder of tourist accommodation, allow visits in indoor and domestic settings, reopen indoor visitor attractions, and resume indoor group exercise and training in numbers um, limited to suit the venue. Mr Speaker, we remain committed to the undertakings we made this time last year. We will continue to keep this place appraised of our thinking, of our rationale and of our decisions. So thank you for facilitating us this evening after the executive meeting. I thank the ministers for making their statement and I will now invite members to ask the ministers their questions. It will allow a period for, of around one hour uh, for this uh, session. It is my intention to allow all members who wish to ask a question to do so. There will also be an opportunity for supplementary questions. Uh, however, this does depend very much on how members are focused and succinct in asking their questions. Uh, the Chair of the Committee for the Executive Office will be allowed a little bit more latitude than members uh, in asking his question, given their role as a chairperson. So I call uh, Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the ministers for their uh, statement today. We are in the position today where restrictions can begin to ease for two reasons. First of all, the incredible effort from the nurses, doctors and health service staff who have worked to exhaustion to keep us safe and to roll out the vaccination programme. And secondly, each and every person who has made sacrifices, some the ultimate sacrifice, over the last four months to keep themselves and their communities safe. They have created the conditions uh, that brought us from a very difficult place to one where we can restore a bit of hope. Now, scrutiny isn't negativity, but I want to ask the uh, First Ministers, when the executive plan was originally uh, published, there was no detail on the indicators and the data that would be used to make the decisions on the dates that will ease restrictions. And despite promises of dates today, a lot of what has been announced is still indicative, which falls short of what a lot of people will want in their sectors. So we are left in a position where we have da no data and so in some places uh, no dates for them to move towards. So can the First Ministers commit to publishing the data and the indicators that would be used to make these important decisions? Am I taking that question, Can Corlidge? Just to say, it's actually incorrect to say that a lot of this is actually um, not clear because there's only one section of the announcements which we're making today that is indicative, which is the, the further end, um, as you would expect. And that's just because of, we need to judge it based on the prevailing health um, circumstance at that time. But for all the things that are going to change on the 23rd of April, all the close contact, driving lessons, driving tests, all, the outdoor sport, um, organised sport, all those things that are going to happen on the 23rd are confirmed, as are everything that's going to open on the 30th of April. Um, the indicative uh, section refers to the 24th, and that's because that's the, we're trying to give people the, the ability to plan. Um, and all being well, and with the public support, these will be the confirmed dates. Um, but that was the recommendation and the ask of the public health team, and the CMO and the, and the chief um, scientific advisor, in terms of that being an indicative piece, because we need to come back to it because it's so far in front of us. But we did want to give people, we promised people would try to give time to plan, so that's what we've done. In terms of the data that's being published, we've always said that we've got a, we want to see all the data put out there. There's a considerable amount of data that's put on the health department's website, as, as you would know, on the dashboard, and um, more than content um, for, for that to continue to be shared. Um, you do deserve to have the data. This house deserves to have um, the data. And I think, um, just to say, I think it's unfortunate that 
um, today. A lot of the information was leaked um, and was being discussed in the media before this House had a chance to, to discuss it, whilst we worked our way through the detail of it. And, you know, it took us all to work together, but I'm very glad that we've arrived at a collective executive position after all of our deliberations. Supplementary, Colin McGlath. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. And I suppose it is the point that if there is a date and it's indicative and it's based on data, they need to know the data so we can get that we're working towards that indicative date and it becomes more real. But, Ministers, there was a sense of chaos, as has been announced uh, by yourself in the briefing uh, and leaking that came this morning, which fed the impression that some of the announcements are a result of private lobbying uh, rather than strategy based on science. But to be assured that the decisions have been made in the best interests of public health, will you commit to holding a public inquiry into the decision making taken by the executive during this crisis as soon as possible afterwards? So thank you for that question. Uh, I think uh, those of us who sit in the executive are always uh, interested to see people outside of the executive uh, from this House uh, tweeting. Uh, and putting out the dates. Uh, before I left home this morning, uh, Mr. Speaker, I was interested to know that the SDLP member for uh, West Tyrone had put up a full list of what the executive was going to quote unquote rubber stamp today. Uh, I'm pleased to say, actually, we took the time, as the Deputy First Minister has said, to work through uh, all of the decisions today uh, and to actually. Um, talk to our Chief Medical Advisor, our Chief Scientific Advisor, uh, to discuss the economic impacts, the societal impacts, of course the health impacts that has allowed us to come with this package uh, to the House, which I think, uh, whilst of course we would always like to do more in these circumstances, I think is a very balanced package, uh, is a package that will allow uh, shops to reopen uh, by the 30th of April. It will allow gyms to reopen, and goodness, we have had many people lobbying about those issues um, on the 30th of April. I think it is a balanced package. Uh, in terms of the public inquiry, we have always said that there will be an inquiry after um, the uh, COVID pandemic. Of course, there will be. There will be many lessons to learn. Uh, whether that public inquiry takes place at a United Kingdom level or takes place uh, at uh, a locally devolved level, uh, we will have to wait and see. But I have no doubt um, that the scrutiny that the Chair often talks about will continue, as it should, because what we have been dealing with have been life and death decisions. We have been dealing with stopping the livelihoods of so many people to try and protect their lives uh, over this past year. And it has been hugely, hugely difficult to make those decisions. However, there will be a public inquiry after that, and uh, that will include this House uh, as well as members of the Executive. Nicole Palm, Cameron. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First and Deputy First Minister for uh, this very much welcomed statement to the House this evening. Um, I wanted to ask around the infection rate which uh, is currently in the Republic of Ireland and uh, given the fact that our, our neighbours in the Republic are well behind in their vaccine rollout in, compar in comparison to Northern Ireland, what concerns does the First Minister have around um, the information um, and has there been any uh, resolution to the issue around the passenger locator form um, for those reliable arriving into Dublin and then travelling up to Northern Ireland? So, unfortunately, uh, on the last issue, we still haven't had the passenger locator form uh, issue dealt with in a satisfactory way. I really regret that, uh, particularly because uh, I think the Republic of Ireland actually added some countries to their red list um, just recently, um, and we don't have that data coming up here to Northern Ireland, and I think that's to be greatly regretted. Uh, one of the issues that we were able to speak about today with the Chief Scientific Advisor was around his modelling uh, for the next six months uh, in terms of what he sees coming over the horizon. And of course, um, he is looking at worst case scenarios, best case scenarios, and, and then the middle way. And he was telling us um, that factors in the positive, such as vaccination, uh, the fact that there will be increased uh, immunity for the population, uh, and then the seasonal effects that we often talk about. You know, do, we all remember last summer how the R number dropped back and then came up very quickly again in, in September, October time. But the, some of the negative factors 
are we, we cannot be positive about how much immunity people have and whether it's going to wane, uh, particularly in the older population, uh, whether there will be more new variants. And I think um, that from what we have seen, there will be more new variants, unfortunately. Uh, and then, of course, the other issue he mentioned was the movement into Northern Ireland from higher incidence levels. And that's something that does con concern us, uh, particularly in relation to the Republic of Ireland. And you're right to mention the fact that they have twice as much uh, incidence at the moment, uh, according to our graphs that were shared today. So we will, of course, continue to monitor uh, what is going on in our own modelling and what is going on uh, with our nearest neighbour in the Republic of Ireland. Supplementary, Paul Cameron. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, for the chance for a supplementary, and I thank First Minister for that answer. It's very disappointing, I have to say, that um, a full year on, that this issue of the passenger locator information has not been resolved. That's very, very disappointing, uh, and given the, the threat that the new variants have, um, I, I think it's quite unreasonable that, that this issue hasn't uh, been brought to a head and actually dealt with. But in terms of the announcement made today from the Department of Health um, in relation to the need for those who are close contacts of a positive case now to test, um, whether they're symptomatic or not, I presume, is a, a good way to help control um, what will be a continued outbreak of this virus and uh, do, does the First Minister uh, think that our, our t test, trace and protect system is able to cope with that increased burden that's now going to be upon it from, from now on? Well, um, firstly, just on your, on your first question, just to say, I mean, the stronger and the, the, the better our cooperation across this island, then the better we'll all be as a people. And I think that needs to continue. I, I welcome the fact that the CMOs meet and, and converse every Friday morning, and I think that's important because what happens in Cork will have an implication for what happens in Tyrone and vice versa. And I think it's really, really important that we have strong cooperation across this island. Um, I've always advocated that we had a two islands approach to COVID. And now, particularly where we are with the virus being suppressed, and if we continue in this vein, and as the vaccine rollout um, continues in the 26 counties, I hope that we get to the point where we are aligned again. Um, as we have saw throughout the course of the pandemic, there's been times when we were the best in terms of the response. There was times when we were the worst, and that has happened um, across the island. So I think that um, we just need to focus on working together and get resolution to things like the traffic uh, or the travel locator form, particularly given that travel is going to be a really sensitive issue. But in terms of the test, trace and, and, and protect system, now when we get to the point where we're able to remove a lot of the harsh restrictions, then the focus has to be on what are the other tools in the box in terms of managing this virus going forward. So absolutely, test, trace and, and tracking system needs to be 100% perfect. It needs to be actively finding cases and dealing with them head on. So I think that the, the focus very much as we come to the end of this wave, and we're not there yet, we have to keep saying that even though today is a good day, um, I think a lot of the shift and focus needs to come from so what else can we now um, uh, use in terms of fighting this virus and let's not you know, try to avoid as much as we best can um, ever going back into the, another cycle of, of lockdown because we need to try and avoid that. So I think that if we're not successful with um, an excellent test, trace and track then this is inevitably where we'll end up again. Um, and I thank the, the First Ministers for their statement. It's a, a very significant announcement of relaxation measures today and a very welcome signal of, of the progress that we have um, made collectively as a society. Um, it will certainly be very welcome news for businesses. Um, the dates for businesses, including those in the hospitality sector, some of whom I met earlier today, um, will give people the ability to, to plan for reopening and, and that step back towards some sort of normality. But can I just ask the, the Joint First Ministers if the Executive will provide ongoing support for those businesses that continue to be impacted by the restrictions? Thanks um, for the question. And you know, there's no doubt, <coughs> excuse me, that the hospitality sector and the tourism sector have been the worst impacted by this pandemic. And by any stretch of the imagination, they've come to, at the tail end of every easement um, period because of the, of the nature of the spread. Um, so I'm really glad that we've been able to reach a, a situation today where we're able to give that sector as well an indicative date around um, the, the indoor um, situation, but obviously a, a full-on date for um, the outdoor situation because we know outdoors is obviously safer than indoors. But I think you make a good point because obviously the one thing that we've been able to do well as an executive is that, for example, the support that's paid to the hospitality sector is double what's paid um, elsewhere. 
So I think that's, you know, it's been a welcome thing that we've been able to support those uh, businesses to mitigate the damage, not to replace their income, of course. Um, but the one thing we have decided as an executive today is that um, even though that some people will be able to open partially, until we have the full reopening, people won't be able to realise their full potential as a business. So we're going to continue with the grant aid fund funding it for all businesses in the hospitality sector until we get to the end. And the other area that we've also agreed to support continually as well is the gyms, because gyms are allowed to open for one-to-one -one training, but again, no classes, no group sessions, so they're not able to reach their full potential and income. So we're going to continue to fund them until we have full reopening there as well. Okay, Stella, Keeve Archibald, supplementary question. Um, I, I thank the, the Joint First Minister for that response. That will be very welcome news to, to very many businesses. Um, I think the next formal date of review is the 13th of May, so I just wanted to ask, do you intend to give businesses as much clarity around dates for reopening as possible, as early as possible? Garmevich. Well, absolutely. I mean, one of the reasons why the date for reopening of hospitality is indicative is that we will be looking at the data um, between the 23rd of April, the 30th of April, and then the, the 13th of May, 20th of May. We're going to continuously track that data to see if there are any changes that concern us. And that means that we are going to have to continue the very close um, contact with some of the sectors so that we can help them to understand where things are at at this present moment in time. Are we going to be able to confirm that? I very much hope that we can. And I think um, you know, the, the, the chair of the uh, TEO committee made the comment about this is because of the work of the NHS and all of their members, of course, including the volunteers and, of course, the population for the way in which they've made so many sacrifices. That's absolutely uh, correct to say that. Um, so we hope that people will continue to work with us, they will adhere to what we have put out today, um, and by doing that, we will be able to open then on the 24th of May in respect of hospitality. I call Robbie Butler. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I uh, uh, thank the First and Deputy First Minister for their uh, uh, for coming here tonight. Um, this year I'll be my 25 years to Mrs Butler uh, in September and I'm sure today she'll rue the rest of her days. But as you will know, the wedding industry <laughs> uh, the wedding industry is worth around £250 million pounds per year uh, to the Northern Ireland economy and the industry has been hit hard. And that's uh, not even speaking about the couples who have uh, tried to plan for their weddings over this last year. Um, can you outline perhaps uh, especially for the wedding industry and those operators who fell through the, the gaps for grants and other monies, uh, if there are any other funding opportunities between now and weddings actually happening, because it takes at least six to eight weeks to plan for those wedding receptions. And we hope that um, when people look at what we've announced today, that they will recognise that weddings and um, families and all of the things that we've talked about is one of the reasons why we're trying to give that indicative date. Uh, of the 24th of May for the opening of the rest of the hospitality sector. Uh, as you will know, uh, last Monday the 12th we moved to a risk assess system for weddings uh, and funerals in, in places of worship and uh, uh, indeed in other places that host civic partnerships. Um, those um, will be on a risk-based assessment, um, but uh, we have not reached the point where we can have wedding receptions indoors as yet, uh, and that's why we thought it was important to give that. It's one of the very important reasons why we felt there was a need to give an indicative date for the rest of the tourist accommodation, because you're right, they do need time to plan. People need to know, uh, are we going to be able to have our wedding reception? And uh, I hope that this gives some certainty uh, to people who are planning their weddings. Uh, like him, I was married 25 years ago, and uh, I can't imagine the uh, horror that's going through uh, couples at the moment trying to plan their weddings. Uh, we just took it for granted that everything was going to be there and in place. And it has been an incredibly difficult time for couples planning their weddings. I have emails from people who have changed their weddings three, four times. That's really dreadful for them, uh, and they'll certainly not forget their wedding when they actually get there. Supplementary, Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your answer, uh, First Minister. And then the shorter one just is: um, Do bridal boutiques come under uh, close contact services? Uh, yeah, the answer to that is yes, they do. So um, they are able to to work from the 23rd of April. And can I also say congratulations to you and your wife on your anniversary? And I hope that you've got a meal booked for her for the 24th. And I call Paula Bradshaw. 
Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Ministers, for your statement today. I haven't been so happy in months with to hear that the gyms were reopening soon. Um, so my, my question is about the driving instruction theory tests and driving te um, the, the actual tests themselves. Um, where, where and when is the extra capacity going to come forward, and um, is there going to be any prioritisation for those people who actually can't go, get back to work because they don't have a test? So the 23rd of April is the, is the date for both um, instruction and theory tests and also driving tests, but in terms of the decisions are of um, how that's going to be done, how they're going to deal with the backlog, that will all come under the Department of Infrastructure, so they will have to provide um, the detail, but I'm happy to pass on uh, your question to the, the Minister and ask um, for a response to that. Um, thank you. I suppose that the issue that happened the last time was that they, they, they opened quite quickly and they got all sucked up and then the people who really probably needed it in terms of care workers and stuff weren't able to access it. So it was really about um, using the system properly. But my second supplementary question really is about the issue of the gyms and the sport, for example. We talk a lot about mental health and the pandemic of that that will happen at the far side of this um, COVID pandemic. And I'm just wondering what consideration has actually been given to the impact on the physical health of the population through this one year plus of um, quite a sedentary lifestyle. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, I, I think we have concentrated quite a bit on the mental health and well-being of the population for very obvious reasons. Um, we have always, throughout the pandemic, encouraged people to get out and to walk if they can and to take some exercise if they can, recognising, of course, that uh, some people live in built-up areas and maybe they can't do that. Uh, but certainly, uh, I would imagine that the uh, Minister for Communities will want to look at the physical well-being as well, of course, as the Ma uh, Minister for Health. Um, the Minister for Education is very keen that young people get back to sport as quickly as possible. Sport is now allowed within schools. However, inter-school sports is still not in a place where we can uh, see that happening, simply because it would involve too much mixing in terms of the inter-schools. But we hope that that can happen uh, in the near future. Call Paula Bradley. Speaker, and can I also thank the First and Deputy First Minister for the statement today. And I know for, for many it will give a little bit of hope um, that we're moving towards some, something of a more normalised society. Um, I, I just wanted to ask the question around funerals, and I welcome the relaxation um, that happened on Monday around funerals, but can I just ask for some clarity around gatherings at grave sites? Thank you to the member for that question. From the 12th of April, as I've indicated, we agreed to increase the number permitted to attend um, marriages, civil partnerships, funerals, informed by a risk assessment for the venue. But that extends to the numbers at the graveside as well. Uh, so it is subject to a risk assessment um, of each particular burial ground because they will vary, uh, and we acknowledge that. So whoever is in charge of operating the burial ground, whether it's the council or whether it's church or whatever, they should liaise with any of the funeral directors and communicate uh, with them if there are any issues with that particular venue. It's important that that happens. Supplementary, Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer. Um, I attended my own uncle's funeral on Monday past, um, and it was a, a very, very strange event to go um, to the limited numbers in the church and then go to the graveside. And very much within our tradition, we have receptions after funerals. I just want to ask the question, um, because there is that time that's needed to celebrate someone's life and to talk to people. Um, has that been considered whenever you're looking at wedding receptions? Um, have you considered the funeral receptions as well? And can I express my condolences to you on just on the loss of your of your uncle and, and to your family? Um, yes, we've considered both things, and despite what was leaked this morning, um, and hope maybe got some people's um, hope up that that they were going to move to 30 for both weddings and for um, the, the the family getting together um, after a funeral. That that's not what we have agreed. We've just because we've brought forward the date to the 24th, um, we thought that um, that would cover both. It's all settings, all hospitality settings. So if one, people wanted to go back as a family to, um, I don't know, a community centre or a social club, a, a, a hotel, um, a restaurant, that would be provided for from the 24th. So hopefully that will give some comfort at that time. I call John O'Dowd. Gormay uh, Ogot, can I call you on Paula's questions about the end of life, my questions about the start of life, and uh, maternity appointments and the ability of partners to go along with uh, their uh, pregnant partner to a paternity appointments or even to the birth of the child. Is there any opportunity or indication from the announcement today that that will be the case moving forward? 
Well, this matter was raised uh, by your colleague, the Deputy First Minister, today uh, at the uh, Executive, and the Health Minister uh, was clear in relation to visiting uh, into hospitals. It is dependent on where the alert level is uh, nationally. So, at the moment, uh, UK alert level is level four. Um, and I think the indication he was making to us today was that when that drops to alert level three, that that will allow more visiting into uh, hospitals. Uh, that has been looked at as we understand it this weekend. So I'm hopeful that we will see a change in that because, uh, like you, I think we have all been contacted by people who want to go into the hospitals and visit, but also, of course, to attend the birth of their children uh, and uh, other very significant uh, life uh, events. So it's very important that that happens. So we will be hopefully able to give some news on that next week. Supplementary, John Dowd. Okay, you, pa okay, sir, you pass. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to Christopher Stalford. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask my right honourable friend uh, or the Deputy First Minister, does a caravan constitute self-contained tourism destination? Please. Yes. <laughs> Nice. I am. Um, uh, that was a, a surprisingly quick answer, and I'm grateful to the, the First Minister for providing it because that will be welcome to many, many people um, around the country who've been paying thousands in fees for caravans that they haven't uh, been able to access. I think during the course of uh, this period of time, uh, our people have been very frustrated, and I think we're now at the point where they're sick to the back teeth uh, with restrictions. Uh, one of the places where I think uh, that is definitely the case, is young people wanting access to their university education in a way that is not confined to online learning. Can I ask uh, my right hon. Friend, the First Minister or the Deputy First Minister, when we will see some progress on that, particularly in a constituency like mine where university is a thriving part of the heart of the community? Understand it. Um, at the moment, uh, those courses that require uh, practical application, such as medicine, are in the university, so they are continuing with in face-to-face uh, -face learning. Those um, courses, which can be practically taught online, are continuing to be online, and it is a matter for the universities as to when they will change that. I do agree with the. Uh, member for South Belfast, however, in terms of the university experience that our young people are currently not experiencing. You know, they're at home, they're online, they're not with their friends, and they're missing that critical university experience that he and I both went through. And I think it would be very welcome if we can move back to some sort of course. They are moving into the situation now where they're getting very close to exam time. Um, and uh, it will be difficult uh, to move them into class uh, for, for lessons because they will be immediately moving into exam time. But I do recognise uh, the concern that the member has raised because it's one uh, very close to home for me. Uh, I call Colm Gillernoy. I remember Colm Gillernoy. Gormi Agat, Kian Corlia, and Gormi Agat, Gucci Lesson Ira. Thank you uh, to, for, for the statement today. And I suppose on this day of undoubted optimism, and I think it's, 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 it's fantastic that people and, uh, are starting to see some uh, light and hope at the end of the tunnel. But I have to say, a large part of my thought today are with those people for whom daycare and respite services were ended overnight almost a year ago, many of whom themselves are elderly and vulnerable and were left in very difficult situations and remain in those situations. So I look forward to engaging with the Health Minister in relation to those, those people. But we have heard a lot of uh, coverage about the vaccine programme and the vaccines themselves. And I have to say that the rollout of the vaccination programme has indeed been a tremendous piece of work. Would the Joint Force Ministers agree with me that our health and social care uh, staff have done excellent work in getting us to this point. Thanks for, for the question. And just on your first point, I absolutely concur because it's those families that need that additional support that have been left um, starved of that support um, for over a year now. So, particularly when it comes to daycare opportunities, just that additional support that particularly families with a child with a disability or a young adult with a disability um, require that support. So, I very much look forward to the Department of Health because that's obviously within the remit of. The department and I hope that the Department of Health now, given where we're at in the pandemic, that they can instruct that that will now change and that families get their full support back again. And just to concur with the, the 
you know, the vaccination programme has been just, you know, absolutely amazing. And all credit to Patricia Donnelly and all the staff that have actually worked tirelessly to make it make it work. Um, I'm so delighted. Even in um, recent days, I actually got my first dose uh, myself through my own GP, and just to get that call is just fantastic. And you just you feel so liberated by it. Um, and I know it's not everything; it's only the first dose, but you just you do feel so much of a sense of hope. And we felt that in our family whenever my own mother got it as well. So I think that um, one of the things that we are so lucky to have, and why we're able to make these announcements today, is in part because of the sacrifice of the public, because of the work of the healthcare staff, and because of the vaccination team and the rollout of the vaccination programme. Supplementary, Colin Wilderney. Uh, Gora Margaret, the, the Joint Force Minister has answered. I was going to ask her would she take up the vaccine herself, but I think she's indicated that fairly. Gora Margaret. And I call Justin McNulty. Gora Margaret, Ken Corla. This is a positive day. The sun is shining. There's summer heat in the air, and the First Ministers are sitting shoulder to shoulder. Many young people, sports teams, um, loader drivers, business owners, and families will be breathing a huge sigh of relief. But for others, there is less certainty, and there isn't such cause for relief. Daycare for adults was mentioned with learning and, and physical disabilities, respite centres reopening, people awaiting surgery and appointments, and waiting return to no, normal GP services. Appointments for those on mental health waiting lists or awaiting treatment such as CBT, and a full return to physical CAMS and children's family therapy services. Have you any information on when those will re be recommencing, and will, avail will appropriate funding be allocated to our health service to get the, address the, the huge waiting list challenges? I understand that um, the health minister was in this house this week um, talking about rebuilding services. Um, and that is everything that he has mentioned, and I concur with him. Uh, we do need to get all of those services back into a rhythm um, in terms of GP services, the child and the adolescents, mental health teams need to be back in place. Uh, so absolutely, uh, those are matters for uh, the Health Minister. And as I said, he he's, he's come and he's told us about rebuilding services within the trusts. So this is really uh, an issue for him, but we'll certainly pass on uh, the members' concerns in relation to all of those issues. Supplementary, Justin McNulty. Um, lockdown has a lot to answer for First Ministers. And from my wife's and my own perspective, we are expecting our first child on the 20th of this month. Can you tell me, First Ministers, uh, at what point will I be able to attend the birth of my uh, son? Give the gender away and everything. Um, I hope that was discussed gender at home. <laughs> and you're not going to get a clip whenever you get home. <laughs> Congratulations to you. Um, brilliant news and fantastic news. And, and, and you're, you're, you're right to ask the question because it's a question which I think probably every MLA in this house has been asked throughout mm. the pandemic. And you know, partners having to go in by themselves and not having that support. And, that's, and it's a, such a big time in your life, and you want that support. So we, we raised it today in the executive because we do think it's time to get that up and running again. Allow that support allow you to have your partner or uh, someone with you whenever you go into your antenatal um, appointments and also then for the birth. So um, I hope that given where we are today and all the positive things that we've been able to achieve today, that that works for you and that, that everybody else gets the opportunity to be there as well. well at least you can't say you were bored. Um, I call John Stewart. And can I thank the First and Deputy First Minister for their statement, for their answers thus far. Uh, there is light at the, long, at the end of this long dark tunnel, and these will no doubt go down very well with all of our constituents. But I'm sure, like all MLAs in the House, the phone is pinging away here with questions that we don't yet have answers to. So I'm going to put a couple to yourself. In terms of travel, First and Deputy First Minister, to elsewhere in the United Kingdom, what is the current assessment and the state of play? And will people still have to require to isolate when they get back? And if so, when will that be amended? Thank you. So, thank you very much. This is a question I actually asked of our, of our health minister today. Uh, he'll be glad to know uh, because it, it's something that a lot of people have been asking around moving uh, um, in and out of the, or not in and out, around the co intra common travel area. Because at the moment there is guidance that says if you're staying for longer than 24 hours, then you're supposed to isolate. Um, and I think that guidance should be looked at. 
uh, because there is a need for people to visit fam friends and family uh, within the common travel area. Uh, there's also issues around, for example, examiners coming over to do music exams and what have you. And if they're doing them for two days, then they're meant to, under the guidance, it's not the law, under the guidance, they're meant to quarantine for 10 days. So it's something that the Health Minister is looking at at this present moment in time. Supplementary, John Stewart. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Um, no doubt one of the sectors that will be overjoyed by this will be the health and beauty sector, who have been champing at the bit to get back and start doing all the haircuts and nails and everything else. Many of them have been contacting me because they are very keen to operate in a safe and legal manner. Are the, are the guides um, and rules that were in place before Christmas still applicable? And will NI Direct be updated as quickly as possible to ensure that everyone has the information at hand? I declare an interest as someone who is dying to get to the hairdressers. Um, Yes, the guidance remains the same as was previously, so all the mitigation which they have previously invested in uh, and done so brilliantly um, w remains the case. But in terms of any of the sectors, if there's any guidance to be updated, it will be updated on the, on the website. But um, as far as I'm aware, for close contact, um, it remains the same as previous. Nicole Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And uh, like others, uh, on this probably the best weather day of the year, um, I, I do welcome uh, this, this statement, uh, and I'm no doubt that it will give encouragement to, to, to our folk uh, right across the many, many areas. I do want th this is a statement on behalf of the executive, the five parties in the executive, and for those parties who, in the not too distant future, might be willing to criticise the statement, will recognise that they are indeed criticising their own colleagues uh, within, within the executive. And that does appear to have been the practice on following previous uh, statements, uh, First Minister. But can I ask you, First, First Minister, what um, are the various steps that are planned to assist the hospitality industry, which is so important to our economy at, at this stage? Well, thank you very much uh, for that question. And the member is absolutely right. And look, we do apologise for this being a late sitting this evening, but we absolutely felt it was right to try and work through um, what we were looking at today as five parties to try and get consensus. And what you see before you may not be what we all would have liked to have seen, but it is actually consensus that was arrived at in terms uh, of the five parties. So that is absolutely the case. In terms of the hospitality industry, the Economy Minister has been keeping in very close contact uh, with the industry. There has been a number of uh, schemes that have been developed to try and help the industry mitigate against their very obvious losses. Um, and that's all we can do at this point in time, um, particularly in relation to the large um, hospitality venues uh, scheme, which is there to try and help some of those infrastructural uh, people that are very much the infrastructure of our tourism economy. Uh, so we'll keep talking. That continues until they open. That scheme continues, uh, as does the LRSS, of course. Um, and uh, we will want to speak to them about the emerging trends in health as we go along through late April and into May, because it's so important uh, that they continue to hear from us um, as to where we think we're going, but I very much hope that we're able to open on the 24th of May. Supplementary, Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and th I thank those, uh, the Minister for, for those, again, those, those encouraging words. The First and Deputy First Minister will recognise the importance to Northern Ireland's economy overall of tourism. Uh, and in particular, much has been made about the, the, uh, about businesses requiring to have notice of reopening uh, again. Uh, I, I note the remarks you made about uh, trans transportation within the UK common travel area, um, but perhaps uh, you could outline what the thinking might be in terms of encouragement for the tourism industry in particular. Just, I mean, as I said earlier, the, the two sectors most hardest hit are obviously hospitality and tourism. So um, we know that there's a need to try to support um, all of our industries who've been decimated as a result of the pandemic. Um, and we're working our way through um, all of that. Our priority now is to get them opened. Um, we want to uh, look towards an, um, future tourism potential. Um, we need to work with the industry. We're going to have to you know, sell what we have to offer, you know, so I think we're going to have to come at that 
and certainly would be very supportive of the Economy Minister's proposals that she'll probably um, bring forward in terms of rebuilding um, the tourism sector. We're looking at recovery as a whole, so we're looking at societal recovery, economic recovery, well-being, our own personal recovery, um, of all those things to focus on, and that will all be factored in as part of our programme for government discussions and, um, and our plans for going forward. So we don't underestimate the challenge in front of us to help some of these industries up off the floor, um, but we're determined to try and support them to do the best that we can for them. I'm sure both ministers uh, will agree with me that this is a very good week with the children back to school and being able to enjoy their sport and physical exercise. And just when I was leaving my own children to school this morning, I had a short conversation with the principal and he was telling me he received guidance uh, from the education minister last night to say that uh, breakfast and after school clubs could open with immediate effect. And that's good also. However, the principal was saying that that advice contradicts previous advice in terms of keeping children in, in their own particular bubbles. And I'm wondering, uh, could, could the joint ministers tell us if the education minister is going to provide clarification to school principals? The letter that went out uh, yesterday uh, was designed to give clarity because there had been some questions uh, around sport, for example, um, around music tuition, which I think was also included uh, in the letter, but also around that wraparound care piece because uh, some of the schools were very concerned that they weren't able to provide that care for children uh, at breakfast clubs and after school clubs. So it was really important to get that clarification out. So I hope that people, whatever was said beforehand, recognise that the latter one stands. So that is the guidance now in terms of wraparound care uh, at those schools. Supplementary passion. Okay, you decline. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I thank the people, and particularly the children and young people of Northern Ireland, who have complied uh, with profoundly challenging restrictions throughout this pandemic uh, and for whom this will be positive news today. Can I particularly welcome the return to sport uh, and can I ask if that return to squad training will see any limit on the numbers for squad training and in relation to indoor group exercise scheduled to return on May 24th, has any consideration been given to earlier reopening of non-aerobic socially distanced group exercise such as yoga Pilates and children's gymnastics. Um, thanks um, for the question. In terms of the, the numbers for um, sport, uh, I think the numbers should not exceed 100, so that includes everybody who is necessary. They're asking that you only include people who are necessary as part of, the, of being able to have the game, so, and spectators are still not um, permitted at this stage. Um, on the issue of um, more indoor sport, and this is again something that I think probably a lot of us are lobbied on in terms of um, group exercise or even like dance classes and things like that indoors. It's the view of the health um, team, both the Chief Medical Officer and Scientific Advisor, that those things are still um, too risky. So that's why the date of the 24th of May has been allocated to, to that area. Um, like, like everything, we, we constantly look at all these things and, um, and, we'll, and we'll continue to do so throughout this, but at this stage, that's where it sits the 24th. Break, Chris uh, thank the uh, Deputy First Minister for the response and the uh, confirmation of the, the number not exceeding 100 for uh, competitive games. Uh, the the question is also in relation to squad training, um, whether there be any limit on those numbers. Hopefully um, that will be in line with a uh, suitable number required, uh, given that the, the limitations on number at this moment in time. Um, can I ask, in relation to uh, weddings, if it's possible to be uh, clear with regards to the, the number of guests that people celebrating uh, their weddings might be able to have at the reception after May 24th? Again, that will depend on the size of the venue uh, that they're having their wedding reception at. Um, obviously, some venues are very large, and so you'll be able to have larger weddings, but if the venue is quite small, then it will have to be uh, a risk assessment carried out to see um, how that can be uh, achieved. Uh, in terms of the squad piece, I think it is fair to say that, as the Deputy First Minister says, it should not exceed 100, but it should be kept to a minimum as what is required 
for that particular sport. And um, I think it's fair to say that each of the different codes will have advice and guidance out in relation to that to uh, each of their various uh, clubs around Northern Ireland. I call Paul Given. Mr. Speaker, can I um, welcome today's statement? It is progress that's being made, and I want to commend my right honourable friend, the First Minister, and her DUP ministerial colleagues, without whom I believe we wouldn't have made the same progress today, uh, and I'm sure we could have made further progress uh, as well if left to our, ourselves. In respect to some of these restrictions, the aspect around travel that is being raised with me is that currently you need to have an essential reason to go to Great Britain. Is that being removed so that non-essential travel into Great Britain will be allowed, as well as then the removal of the requirement to then quarantine? So this, this is the very important issue that we've been talking about in terms of the common travel area, that there's a need to look at that guidance. He's absolutely right. It's for work purposes at the moment that you can travel to Great Britain and not have to quarantine. Um, so it is important that that is looked upon because there's a lot of us that have friends and family uh, in Great Britain and will want to travel there to see them. And at the moment, we can't do that uh, under the current guidance. So I think it is fair to say this is going to be something that we will be looking at in the, in the near future. Uh, at the moment, as you know, we have moved from stay at home to stay local. So in terms of in Northern Ireland, that is what the guidance uh, says. But I would hope that we can move to look at that whole common travel area piece uh, within the next number of weeks. Supplementary, Paul Given. Thank you, and can I thank the Right Honourable First Minister for that uh, response. Uh, one of the areas raised even today at the Justice Committee um, in terms of impact on the courts, and this is something that hospitality has raised, that ultimately the two-metre social distancing rule is the only way in which we will see the right kind of transformation to tackle that problem uh, and a return uh, to not having that requirement in place. So the Deputy First Minister indicated that without a perfect track and trace system, it was inevitable, um, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, that we would go back into another lockdown scenario. Given that as of today, 0.025% of all patients in our hospitals are COVID patients, we've got 60% currently of all adults vaccinated, and we've seen that the atrocious consequences of lockdown, particularly on children, young people, women, low-paid workers. How on earth can we ever allow a situation where we could go back to tolerating any form of restrictions that we have had to endure over the past 12 months? So when will we see the removal of social distancing, of mandatory uh, wearing of face masks, and ultimately the repeal of what everybody has said is draconian legislation impinging upon our civil liberties? Um, I think the first thing I would say to the member that two people died in the last 24 hours as a result of COVID. So we're still living through the pandemic. And the best thing that we can do for the public is to try to um, save lives every day and also to try to get a balance in terms of supporting our industries to be able to open up again and all our, our, our people to be able to get back to some semblance of normality. So um, you, you can't close your eyes and ignore the fact that we're still in a pandemic. We are in a pandemic and people are still dying as a direct result of that. Um, the point I made around um, lockdown scenarios, what the point I was making was that we need to try to avoid any other lockdown scenarios. And the reason I pointed towards test, trace and isolate is because that's one of the tools that actually can help us avoid that. So we need to invest in other mechanisms that actually avoid us having to go into a lockdown scenario. There's not one person in this chamber wants to see us in lockdown scenarios, but unfortunately, because of a global pandemic, they were necessary um, at different times throughout the pandemic. So when can we get to the point where we don't have to you know, stay apart or you know, um, follow the public health advice? We can do that whenever it's safe. We can do that whenever it's safe. And let me also say this to you finally. Don't believe, don't believe your own hype. Every single minister in that executive has been working night and day to try to do their best for the public throughout this pandemic. And every single minister in that executive today was collective and, and unified in their approach to try to maximise the ability for us to be able to lift restrictions at the same time been able to mind the public in terms of the public health um, crisis that we're facing. So there's, I don't question any minister around the table's um, bona fides whenever it comes to trying to mind the public and to steer us through what has been a horrendous time for everybody.
Uh, can Corla and I thank the Joint First Ministers for their statements here this evening. Um, as it has been said, the announcement is very welcome and we're all pleased that the restrictions are being eased. But we also all are very aware of the huge impact that the pandemic has had on people right across the community, um, but particularly on those most vulnerable, um, those living in poverty and housing need and the lonely and families and workers um, in low income on low incomes and it's also been a very difficult time for women with um, an increase in unemployment and in domestic violence. So with this in mind, does the Joint First Minister agree with me that um, a recovery strategy by the Executive should focus particularly on addressing social inequalities? Well, the first thing uh, I want to say to the member is um, you're right to point out that this is having a disproportionate impact on the lower paid uh, and women uh, in particular. It's one of the things that the economy minister was very vocal about today uh, in relation to trying to get a date for uh, the tourism industry because 50% of all those who are furloughed are either from the retail or hospitality sector and most of those people are young people or they're female and they're low paid. So there's absolutely a need for us to get the economy opened up again so that people can have the proper work to go to and get the proper pay that they need uh, to recover. So the recovery plan is part of uh, what we're doing in the executive. Uh, obviously, um, the recovery plan has been brought. Uh, the finance minister has committed to uh, funding that recovery plan uh, from the economy minister, and it's critical uh, that that happens now because we're dealing with stepping out of restrictions today, but what we really have to focus on now is our recovery and rebuilding our society. Yes, of course, building our economy, but rebuilding our society, and I think that's the point that the member is making. Supplementary, Nicola Brogan. Thank you, and I call Matthew O'Toole. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I welcome today's announcements from the from the First Ministers. Um, even if, given some of what we've seen today, the approach of the executive to um, easing restrictions in terms of leaks is a little more colander than calendar, but I'm, I welcome the, uh, where we are today. Can I specifically ask about a sector that isn't mentioned in today's um, uh, statement, and that is our arts sector. There's no mention of outdoor theatre. Our arts sector have been very patient. They haven't been as vocal as some other sectors, but it would be helpful if we could get some detail about, first of all, outdoor theatre, and then more broadly, opening up for theatre and the arts sector in general. So, uh, in terms of uh, large gatherings, whether outdoor or indoor, uh, we did discuss that issue uh, today. Uh, it is felt that we need to do some more work in relation to that. He will be aware of the whole discussion at present around COVID certification uh, in relation to having some sort of evidence to show that you have been uh, vaccinated or at least tested, and that discussion continues at UK government level. Um, at the moment, there are some pilots taking place in England around large events. He'll be aware of those. We will be able to see the data that comes forward from that. And I think we will probably be exploring running some pilot events here in Northern Ireland as well, so that we can look to see how um, uh, that impacts uh, upon the transmission of the virus. So that's the plan. Uh, obviously, we would love to come here and tell you when festivals are back on again and when large gatherings can come together again, uh, but we will continue to work on those issues and, as I say, COVID certification is part of that and pilots is part of that as well. Supplementary, Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I welcome thank you, the First Minister for that clarification. Can I ask her, several members have correctly said that um, uh, hospitality and tourism is critical to our society, to our economy, um, and they have been lobbying hard, as, they, as, as, is, their, um, as is their right. Would either First Minister uh, agree with me that, as we go ahead in the summer, we try and attract tourists, the last thing that Northern Ireland needs is images of civil disobedience and street protests. Whatever your view of any political issue, we really don't need that. Yes, I mean, I think that, that goes without saying. Of course, that's the case. Um, what we need to see is that uh, we don't see a return to the scenes that we witnessed in the last number of weeks um, on our streets, and I hope that that's not the case, and I hope that everybody in this House used their collective political will in order to make sure that that's not the case. I call Alan Chambers. Speaker, uh, Mr Speaker, I'd wish to acknowledge the huge responsibilities that have rested on the shoulders of the Executive over the past year. 
Um, can the First Minister confirm that it is the TEO COVID Task Force, supported by uh, the Cross uh, Departmental Working Group, that holds lead responsibility for managing all possible changes to the regulations and for proposing possible dates for reopening? That being the case, does she agree that all ministers, even those that were reported as speaking out in apparent surprise this morning, will have had formal departmental representation on the working group and therefore have all had equal opportunity to input to and help shape the process? Thank you. Confirm that yes, the cross departmental working group meets every week and all departments are represented on that, our officials um, are on that, and they collectively bring forward, uh, for example, the paper that we had today. They've all had input into the paper that we had today, uh, and then it was up for discussion at the executive, but unfortunately, it didn't get that far before it was in the public domain. Can we bring the member Jerry Carl on to screen, please? Jerry Carl, could just wait for a moment and supplementary Alan Chambers. My Mr. apologies. Speaker, thank you. Thank you. Uh, does the First Minister and Deputy First Minister agree that the Executive, by following the medical and scientific advice to date in shaping aspects of the, lock, the, the lockdown, that undoubtedly many lives in Northern Ireland have been saved from being lost to this dreadful virus? I want to thank uh, the member for his uh, comments around. Um, the responsibilities that lay on our shoulders. And I think I said earlier on that we had dreadful decisions to take about livelihoods and lives. And that is essentially what we've been trying to do over this past year. And we have been very much taking the advice of our uh, medical advisors. And I want to pay tribute uh, to our medical team, uh, the way in which they work with us. It's a tough job. Sometimes we'd like to go faster, uh, and they will express the reasons why they think we shouldn't. But we also have to take into account the livelihoods point, the economy. Uh, we want, when we come out of this dreadful time, to have an economy to go back to. Uh, we want to have a society that has good well-being. And we've talked about mental health today. We've talked about physical health. There are so many issues uh, that we have to try and balance. But uh, as we said earlier, we will look back at this time and we will uh, delve into all of the decisions that have been taken, uh, and that is the right thing to do. But just to say, this has been a tough year for all of us as public representatives. We acknowledge that. Uh, but it's important that we keep at the forefront of our mind the reasons why we do this. And the reasons we do it is to protect our community, to save lives, uh, but also to try and make sure that there's an economy there to go back to as well. And I call Jerry Carl on screen, please. Can I call on Jerry Carl to ask his question? Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thanks, the ministers, uh, for the statement. Uh, ministers, given the fact that the virus is obviously uh, circulating in some areas, there are a hundred cases the per hundred thousand people. The members on mute. Can you hear me, Mr. Speaker? We'll move on to the next question, and, and uh, we'll see if the member can get that resolved, the technical problem. Okay. So I, I called. Can we bring on Claire Stogden on screen, please? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, First and Deputy First Minister. Um, I'll declare an interest. Um, the Economy Minister earlier in the week had suggested that there may have been an announcement in relation to the reopening of all students of FE colleges. I know there are some who are currently doing it where there's a practical element. I know the First Minister had earlier in the meeting um, talked about universities, but I do think there's a difference with FE colleges, not least those sixth form students who are accessing uh, further education uh, colleges as part of their school curriculum. Um, so any indication of when we might get a date for uh, the full uh, return of FE colleges? I think that's a very important question uh, and it's one actually we've been trying to deal with today. For those who have practical applications uh, because the close contact is opening on the 23rd of April, they will be able to have those training sessions again on the 23rd of April. Um, mm -hmm. I think there was some confusion that it might have been this week, but because the regulations need to change to allow close contact, um, that training will start again on the 23rd, whether beautician, hairdresser or whatever. Uh, in terms of the wider uh, full return of FE colleges, I will certainly get the Economy Minister to write to her about mm -hmm. that, because I think it is important that we have clarity in relation to that as well. 
Supplementary, Claire Shuglin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate that, uh, First Minister. Um, I'm going to go to another issue. Uh, touring caravans, is that included in the reopening of caravan parks? <laughs> No, it's, at this stage, it's just the static um, caravans, um, and we'll come back to the issue of the touring caravans. Okay, thank you. Can we return to bringing Jerry Carroll on screen, please? Can we invite Jerry Carroll to try again, make his contribution? Checking the game, you okay, Mr. Speaker? Yes, certainly. Go ahead, please. Thank you, um, and thanks for the statement, Ministers. Uh, given the fact that the virus is obviously still circulating, and in some areas we have 100 cases per 100,000 people, and with warnings from some medical practitioners who warned about previous uh, reckless decisions, how confident are the Ministers about the strategy and uh, how it will not lead to a further spike uh, in cases? Well, of course, in the pandemic, as we've learned day after day um, for over a year now, there's no certainty in a pandemic. So as for what comes next in terms of new variants, um, the spread, um, oh, there's a whole lot of factors that will, um, will mean that we don't know what the scenario could be in a number of months' time. But what I can say is that we're, we're confident that we've arrived at a balanced way forward, that we're, we're living up to our promise to say that we wouldn't keep restrictions in place for any longer than necessary. Um, we are taking some preventative measures, and we've discussed today, um, for example, um, adherence is a, is a big, big thing for us to be able to be successful in what, we're, what we've um, outlined today. So um, we've asked Communities Minister to go and come back with some proposals around, for example, could we support local government to do more in terms of COVID marshals? Um, you know, can we support councils to be able to work with local businesses, whether that be across you know, any of the sectors, from retail right through to food and to hospitality. Um, so we've asked her to go and look and see, is there something more that we can do to support councils, to support the adherence to what we have um, outlined today? Supplementary, Jerry Carl. Uh, thank you, Ethan, sir. Um, I want to ask around the criteria for uh, vaccination, because as of next week, we will have a large number of workers, especially in retail, many thousands of them, uh, returning to work, many of whom do not have uh, a vaccine. Um, so. Will the ministers commit to looking at, or is there any plans currently to look at uh, the vaccination programme to adopt it, to include uh, people in retail, people in hospitality, and especially people uh, in schools, because special educational needs staffs are still uh, not vaccinated as the rate that they need to be? So, as a member will know, the vaccination uh, priority is set out by JCVI, um, and they have set out the different priority categories. I'm happy to take your point back to the health minister in relation to that, but I know in the past when we have talked about different cohorts uh, of workers, uh, whether that's from the uh, chilled meat, for example, uh, industry or from other industries, that it has been the case that uh, we are sticking to the JCVI vaccination route, but happy to take his comments back to the health minister because I understand the point that he is making fully. And members, that concludes questions on a statement, and I want to thank the ministers for making sure that they came here this afternoon on behalf of the executive to deliver their statement, giving due respect to this assembly. So thank you all for your contributions. The agenda item three is the time and date of, uh, of our next meeting. Obviously, we don't have a date for our next meeting, and as soon as I do receive notification from the executive about when a minister next wishes to make a statement to this committee, written notification of the time, date and place will be issued to members in the usual way. That concludes this meeting of the ad hoc meeting is adjourned. Thank you.